Because the arguments to tamper with tithe are repetitive, that is to say that most people just repeat the same arguments, what I'm going to do in this video is begin with a summary, and if afterwards you want to learn more and see the evidence, then that's fine. Tithes and Offerings, Trampling the Conscience by Colin and Russell Standish. The Standish brothers make blatantly false claims about Adventist history. They make false claims about early Adventist leaders. They conflate tithe and offerings. They make claims and provide references with page numbers, but if you actually go read their sources on the exact same pages are whole paragraphs refuting their own claims. They make false claims that Ellen White approved of documents without providing any evidence whatsoever that she was even involved, and strangely, the very documents that the Standish brothers do provide proves the opposite of their claims. The Standish brothers use completely fake quotes. They claim their strongest quote comes from Ellen White, but it did not. It's a total fake, and that's very easy to prove. They openly admit there were research papers and articles with evidence contradicting and undermining their claims, and yet despite their status as medical doctors and PhDs, the Standish brothers make no attempt whatsoever to refute any of those papers. They accuse others of ignoring counsel when they do the same thing. They accuse others for, quote, spreading misinformation about tithe when their own book has multiple pieces of misinformation. And the worst part of the book, the worst part, is that they make very serious accusations that the actions of the North American division are forbidden by heaven, but the Standish brothers never even prove their case. They just make the accusations at the beginning of the book and then move on. This book is poorly written. They provide no evidence or examples of people sending tithe outside the church, so naturally the authors rely heavily on suggestion and speculation. They don't have facts on their side, so they argue from feelings, aka, I feel impressed or I feel convicted. And it's worth noting that the segment or group of people who argue that Adventists can withhold or redirect the tithe, this is their number one favorite book. This is the very best that they have to offer, and their best has more holes than a cheese grater. So that's just a short summary. I was very disappointed with this book. I have heard a lot of good things about the Standish brothers, and as they were educated men and ministers, I expected a lot from them, so I was very disappointed with this. If you'd like to stick around for some concrete examples, let's get started. On the topic of Seventh-day Adventists and tithes, there are people who have published arguments why Adventists should withhold or redirect a tithe away from the organized church. There are several documents passed around online, but the only one that I know of that was actually published in book form was this one right here by the Standish brothers. Both were ordained ministers in the Adventist church. Both were very accomplished men, Colin, a president and leader of several Adventist institutions and independent ministries, and his brother Russell was a physician and president of several Adventist hospitals. So yes, I understand and recognize that these brothers have done a lot of good and have no doubt helped many people in many different ways. However, in this video, we are going to look specifically at their teaching about tithe. It's not about the men, but about their teaching. Almost all of the arguments to withhold or redirect the tithe away from the organized Seventh-day Adventist Church can be sorted into five categories and summarized as the following. Because Adventists already accept that tithing applies to Christians, there are only a few from the Bible, a few about Abraham, and a few others mixing or conflating the language of the two tithes. The remaining three major arguments have nothing to do with the Bible, but all revolve around Ellen White. We have false quotes from SDA leaders, Ellen White quotes with the words means, monies, funds, and the 1905 Watson letter. First of all, notice the title title of this book. It's not just tithes, but tithes and offerings trampling the conscience. The most fundamental difference between tithes and offerings is that one is discretionary and one is not. People have discretion and can choose to send their offerings wherever they want, but tithes are not discretionary. People are free to decide where to give offerings, but not the tithe. The tithe is not subject to personal preferences. One of the most common tactics used to support tampering with tithes is by conflating or confusing tithe with offerings. They confuse the language. People who argue this way will take the discretionary nature of offerings and try to apply it to the tithe. One such way is to label tithe as a matter of conscience, but this is misleading. Everyone has the freedom to choose their religion. However, the moment 
you choose your religion, there are consequences. We Adventists support the freedom to choose to be a Hindu or Buddhist or Muslim. We support the freedom of conscience to worship SpongeBob SquarePants, if that's what you want to do. But if, as a matter of conscience, you choose to join and become a member of the Adventist Church, then paying tithe follows as a consequence of that decision. Saying that tithe is a matter of choice or conscience is like saying you jumped into a swimming pool but did not choose to get wet. That's false. You knew before you jumped into the swimming pool that getting wet was a consequence of the decision. You do have freedom to choose your religion, but you do not have freedom to stop the chain of consequences that follow your decision. Nobody put a gun to anyone's head forcing people to get baptized when you join a church, you do so willingly and it follows that if you believe that your church is God's church, then by definition that church has the God-given biblical authority to both collect and distribute the tithe. I go into this in much greater detail in my other videos, so I'm not going to repeat all of the details here. This is important for this video because simply by the title of the book alone, we already have a red flag. We have not even opened the book and we already have some confusing language but to be fair let's give the authors the benefit of the doubt and let's open it and read the actual contents number one the most popular argument to tamper with tithe is based entirely upon the 1905 letter from Ellen White to Colorado Conference President GF Watson whenever you hear someone say that Adventists can send their tithe wherever they want they will almost always make some reference to Ellen White's tithe and the southern work this book begins on page five and if you just turn the page right here to page Page seven, the Standish brothers state, we have hesitated for years since beginning to prepare this material for publication, having had regard for Sister White's what? Her counsel to who? Elder Watson, president of the Colorado Conference. We believe it was possible that such counsel called for great care to be exercised on the topic. Okay, we have just opened the book. We are only on the third page and they've already introduced the Watson letter. Now what they say about it, we will see later in the book. However, to their credit, to their credit, we can be very thankful because just two paragraphs later, they make the claim, this book upholds the belief that the only acceptable authority is that which is provided from where? From inspired sources. So so that's great. Only inspired sources. Remember that. Keep that in your mind. Only inspired sources of all these statements made in this book, one of the most important, can be found here on page 13. Nevertheless, the North American division has sadly exercised what? Exercised authority, which who? Which heaven has forbidden. Now stop and think about that. To say this is forbidden by heaven is extremely serious. That's a serious accusation. So what did the NAD do that was forbidden? It has legislated that all ministries return the tithes they receive to the respective conferences in which they reside. But just two pages later on page 16, this book was not written to decrease tithe support for denominational ministers. They what? That's the key word right there. They should be tithe supported. Neither was this book written to encourage congregation God ordained a representative form of government for his church. This right here is the most important concept. You have two options. Either the Adventist church is God's church or it is not. And if one believes that it is, then it has the God-given biblical authority to both collect and distribute the tithe. And again, I cover that in greater detail in other videos. Furthermore, in order to become a member of the Adventist church, one accepts the baptismal vows to return tithe to the church and of all all people, the Standish brothers know that very, very well because they were ordained ministers. However, they make this statement that the NAD has exercised authority which heaven has what? Has forbidden. This presents a very serious problem. The Standish brothers are referring to the 1992 year-end meetings where the NAD voted and approved a document that reads, the acceptance of tithe by supporting ministries violates established policy and to channel tithes through any organization other than the local church and local conference is not in harmony with the expressed desire of the who. This is very important. Expressed desire of the world family. Therefore, the NAD made, quote, an earnest appeal to supporting ministries to refrain from accepting tithe from church members. It is very, very important to highlight that what happened in 1992 was simply an affirmation of what was 
already voted and approved by the annual council seven years previously in October 1985. This decision of the NAD year-end meetings that the Standish brothers claim is forbidden, literally, you can see for yourself right here, it literally quotes verbatim from the 1985 official statement. The NAD has not legislated anything. They are simply applying a policy that was already approved by world church leaders at annual council. The Standish brothers have a serious problem because they openly acknowledge that the Adventist church to be God's church, but at the same time, in complete contradiction, they claim that the church has no authority to collect the tithe. They claim that this is improper. The problem is that if the church has no authority to collect the tithe, then by definition, it is not God's church. For those of you who are studying the topic of tithe from an Adventist perspective, the real dilemma here is that many people want so much to call themselves Adventists. They want that name so much, but they do not want to acknowledge and honor the authority of the church. This is only the beginning of the book, and the Standish brothers have already put themselves in an impossible situation, for they openly state right here that denominational ministers should be supported by tithe, and God ordained a representative form of government for his church. But it was this representative form of government at annual council that agreed and approved the tithe policy that the Standish brothers are now claiming is forbidden by heaven. So we have two completely opposed claims. Hopefully, though, the remainder of the book will sort this all out. And what we do find are basically three separate arguments. Fake quotes by Ellen White, the 1905 Watson letter, and conflating tithe with offerings. Page 85, the Standish brothers share this quote. Many of our brethren have expressed themselves to the effect that if their conference continues to pay money to such unconverted ministers, they will withhold their tithes. We do not say it would be right for individuals to withhold from the Lord that which is his, but on the other hand, it is certainly very wrong for the conference to give credentials to such men, and it is nothing less than sin to take the Lord's money to pay for such labor. The Standish brothers then say, here in the most direct manner, Sister White states that it is a sin to pay unfaithful pastors from the tithe. The only problem with this quote is that it's not from Ellen White. It was written by O. A. Olson in the pamphlet titled An Appeal to Our Ministers and Conference Committees. The first nine pages were written by O. A. Olson, a former GC president, with the rest of it being written written by Ellen White. When you search for this quote in the Ellen White database, you won't find it because it was not written by her. But if you go read the digitized version by the Andrews University Center for Adventist Research right here at archive.org, if you scroll down, you will see his name right here, O. A. Olson. Also, if you go to the James White Library at Andrews University, look at the note here, GC President Olson, he wrote the first nine pages. So one of the Standish brothers' key quotes for their book is a complete fake. Most of their arguments in this book are from the 1905 Watson letter. Since I've already made an entire video addressing that situation in detail, I'll just give a summary. The number one most popular argument used to withdraw or redirect tithe away from the organized Adventist church is based on several misleading statements. The Southern Missionary Society was an independent ministry. That is false. The Standish brothers claim repeatedly that the SMS was an independent, self-supporting work, self-supporting workers, self-supporting entity, independent from the denomination national organization. Of course, that is false. Anyone can go right now to the official archives, look up the yearbook for 1905 and 1904, and you can see for yourself the SMS listed right there. The Southern Missionary Society had been for years an official branch of the organized Southern Union. Furthermore, 10 years previously in 1895, it began, quote, under the instruction of and bearing the credentials of the WHO of the General Conference. The people being paid and receiving tithe were independent Bible workers or missionaries. This is a false claim made by many but to their credit, the Standish brothers are careful not to repeat it. Whatever they read and studied before writing this book, they knew that the tithe only went to ordained ministers. So credit to them where credit is due, they did not repeat this false statement. This, however, is very instructive because it demonstrates that the Standish brothers were very well aware. They knew very well the details surrounding the Watson letter, and this will become a problem in just a few minutes. The next false claim is that the tithe was 
solicited. Page 95, representatives of the SMS came to the Colorado conference doing what? Soliciting funds, including what? Including the tithe. That is absolutely not true. Edson White himself stated the complete opposite. In a letter to the GC president describing Palmer's trip to Colorado, he said he never solicited tithes from our people. And the sisters who I visited both said their tithe was voluntary and was in no way solicited. Again, see my longer video for more details. Ellen White commended church members for sending tithes outside the organized church. That also is false. Page 75, citing the Watson letter, the Standish brothers write, Sister White appropriated her own tithe at times and the tithe of others to needy ministers directly, not sending it through regular channels. Again, page 81, they go further. Sister White approved others who appropriated their tithe independent of the denominational channels. This is a very important key point because yes, it is a fact that these women did give tithe outside the official channel. However, it went to an official church destination. The channel or line was not regular, but the destination was. Standish brothers, however, are not arguing to keep tithe inside the official church. They are arguing specifically to take it outside the church to independent or self-supporting ministries. For example, Amazing Facts is a supporting ministry, but it is independent of the church. You will not find it anywhere in the Adventist yearbook because it does not belong to the conference or union. But the Southern Missionary Society did so, but the Standish brothers, like others, of course, do not make that important distinction. What is really troubling is that they devote an entire chapter to the SMS and in section 3, read it for yourself, the evidence of the Southern Missionary Society's independence from the denominational organization is documented as follows. Wow, look at all of these points. I mean, just take a moment to appreciate all of the points that they have listed here and notice something. Isn't it very interesting that there is not even one mention of the SMS being a a part of the Southern Union by 1901. Look at all of these points, not even one mention. Maybe, just maybe, it's because these Standish brothers, even though they were medical doctors and PhDs, even though they were very intelligent, educated men, maybe, somehow, just maybe, they just somehow missed that important piece of info. Oh, but wait a minute, look at this right here. They are citing from some source. Well, what's the source? It's the 1966 Adventist Encyclopedia, and if you've watched my videos before, you you know me, whenever people cite from some source or reference, you must always go get the actual source. So I got the 1966 encyclopedia, opened it up and read from pages 1239 and 1240, and look at this. When at the GC in 1901, the Southern Missionary Society was accepted as a branch of the new union. Isn't that just amazing? I mean, please just take a moment to appreciate this. They cite from page 1239, but somehow both of them just totally missed this. Isn't, isn't that amazing? We have only two options here. Either both of these two highly educated men totally missed this paragraph, or they purposely did not cite this because it would expose and ruin their arguments. And look at the very next page 99. Clearly the General Conference was willing to support two self-supporting workers, Edson White and W.O. Palmer, with tithe funds. And Sister White was willing to support other what? Other non-conference workers with her tithe funds. Did you see that? Did you catch it? The encyclopedia and yearbook explicitly stated that the SMS was part of the conference as early as 1901. Yet again, these two very intelligent men chose to ignore Ignore this and then concluded tithe went to non non-conference workers. It's just so amazing that not just the Standish brothers, but people when they argue against tithe consistently will not cite this information, which means that either all of these people at different times and at different places, all of them have some type of spontaneous momentary blindness, which would be statistically impossible, or or they deliberately will not do so because if they admit these facts, then it will undermine their narrative. If they tell you the facts, it's game over and they know it. And here's a quote for your notes. Speaking of the SMS, the work was not to be carried forward as a private business, but as a conference enterprise. The Standish brothers poured over the writings of Ellen White for years on the subject of tithe and yet amazingly seem to have never come across this quote. 
or they did come across this quote, but again chose not to say anything because it contradicted their claims. And what's even more amazing is that the Watson letter was published on page 215 of the Spalding Megan collection, and this quote comes from a letter concerning the SMS on guess which page? 216. It's literally right next to the Watson letter, and yet, surprise, nobody who argues against tithe will cite this quote. Isn't that, I mean, it's just so amazing. Can, can you say ch 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 cherry picking? Moving on, page 100, the Stanish brothers introduce us to document file 213. For those that don't know, DF or document file 213 refers to a situation involving a Dr. Charles Stewart, a physician who worked with Dr. Kellogg at the Battle Creek Sanitarium. This Dr. Stewart raised questions about the use of tithe, and these questions questions were based completely upon, guess which letter? That's right, the 1905 Watson letter. There are no names, no signatures, and no dates, so nobody really knows who wrote this. Several of the people who argue to tamper with tithe, they claim that it was written by Daniels Prescott and Willie White, but nobody really knows for sure, and as is documented in this paper here, there are several places where Willie White and Daniels themselves explicitly argue against the idea of tampering with tithe. This and the general lack of evidence Nobody knows who wrote this. This document 213 is a three-page memo that is apparently an outline of a suggested approach to Dr. Stewart's question, but again, contains no dates, no signatures, and importantly, no statements from Ellen White. In other words, someone heard about the Watson letter and had questions. They wrote to leadership where people apparently sat down, discussed, and made notes for a response. There is no evidence anywhere that Ellen White had anything to do with document file 213, but but that doesn't stop people today from teaching the exact opposite. For example, the Standish brothers, with no evidence whatsoever, claim Sister White decided not to answer these accusations directly. However, she what? She approved of some of the leaders responding. Again, this is false. There is no evidence anywhere that Ellen White approved of this response. There's no evidence that she was even involved with this response at all. I personally contacted the Ellen White estate, obtained a copy of this document 213 memo, and was given permission to publish it online. I have an entire video for 213, so see that for more details. And as you will see in that video, even if it were true that Ellen White approved this document, it would only prove the opposite of the Standish Brothers' claims. This book has multiple problems. The Standish Brothers repeatedly conflate tithes and offerings. They make multiple false claims about the Southern Missionary Society and its workers. They make false claims about Ellen White. They try to cherry pick from the 1966 encyclopedia any small point to bolster their false claims, but totally ignore contradictory evidence on the very same page. This is interesting because on page 7 right here, they write that those supporting the concept that the conference is the only storehouse for the return of the tithe have chosen to do what? To ignore this council. So the Standish brothers accuse others of ignoring council when they themselves ignore their own sources and evidence. Page 8, the Standish brothers claim the only acceptable authority authority is that which is provided from inspired sources, but they themselves don't use inspired sources. For example, they cite from Document 213 and without any evidence whatsoever, claim that Ellen White approved it, but even if she did, it doesn't matter anyway because 213 proves the opposite of their claims. And the strongest, the best and strongest Ellen White quote they use in all caps is not even from Ellen White. It's a complete fake. Now, if this book had won or maybe Maybe even two errors, that might be understandable, but the book is riddled with problems and it's written by PhDs and medical doctors. So either this is, at best, extreme sloppiness or worse, they purposely published misleading material. And by far, the worst problem is that the Standish brothers never prove their case. They begin the book by charging and accusing the NAD of, quote, improper and unsupported actions that are forbidden by heaven, but nowhere in the remainder of the book do the Standish brothers explain why this is so. Why is it improper for the division to follow the policy of the world church? Standish brothers never explain that. If the church does not have the authority to set up an organized structure to collect and distribute the tithe, then who does? Standish brothers again never tell us. 
if this is improper authority, then where is their definition of proper authority? Where is the objective standard and solution? Again, Stanish brothers don't tell us. They have plenty of accusations, but no answers. However, they have no problem ending their book stating the time has come to close the chapter on the misinformation spread concerning self-supporting work and the tithe issue. The Standish brothers, whose book is full of multiple pieces of misinformation, want to preach to others about spreading misinformation. Accuse others of what you yourself are doing. Again, the people who argue to tamper with tithes, this book is the very best that they have to offer and their very best is a disaster. Now, unfortunately, both of these men have passed away. They have entered eternity, having published a book misleading thousands upon thousands of people into rejecting and rebelling against the God-given biblical authority of the church, and that is quite serious. As I was personally reading this book and researching this history, I really wish that I had had the opportunity to sit down with these men and make a video interviewing them and asking them very good questions. I think it would have been very interesting, really interesting for all of us to see their reactions. So anyways, that's enough for this video. I've covered the major points. There is definitely plenty of material for another video part two, but that's enough for now. So thank you very much for watching and have a nice day.